my father and mother were relatively liberal, not like other fathers, because at the age of 10, my cousins were married. And even they tried to marry me off when I was 10. But uh, I rebelled against that because I loved education. I, I wanted to go to school. And my mother supported me and my father supported me a little bit. But the family were, was uh, manipulated, wanting me to be married like all other uh, girls. But they couldn't because I rebelled and also my mother stood behind me and because I was very good in school. Nawal El Sawadi was born in 1936 in a small village in Egypt. Being a trained physician and a psychologist, she became an activist for women's rights. In 1936, she was named the director of the Women's Health Ministry. Her first writing was in 1972. She wrote a study on the various aggressions carried out against women in the name of Islam and Arabic culture. In the same year, she was dismissed as the director of the Egyptian Health Ministry. I think dissidents, part of it is genetic. My grandmother was a revolutionary. She was a peasant woman in the village. She was illiterate, but she was revolutionary. So it was in her, in her blood. So I took part of her genes in my blood, in my body, but part of it is also acquired. Undeterred, Sawadi continued to write books and to speak against the mistreatment of women in Arabic society. Prior to writing Women at Point Zero, Nawal El Sawadi spent years studying women and their experiences in prison. In 1976, her research was published in a publication titled Women and Neurosis in Egypt, which included case studies of various women who lived in prison or in prison hospitals. The research Nawal El Sawadi conducted during this period helped to shape and inform her writing for Women at Point Zero, allowing her to construct a rich and believable narrative. I wanted to change the world unconsciously. But after that, after I graduated, after I worked, I started to organize women. I started to understand the benefit of organization, that I cannot change the world alone. We must have a big organization. We, and those people who are organized should be aware of their rights. That's why I started writing seriously about women's rights. El Sawadi admits that she became intrigued with one particular woman, a female prisoner in Kanatir prison, and much like the psychiatrist in the novel, and she made it her goal to meet this woman. She is the first prison account of Firdaus, a murderess who has agreed to tell her life story before her execution. The novel explores the themes of women and their place within a patriarchal society, it was originally written in Arabic and was rejected by Egyptian publishers who termed it as dangerous. Later in 1973, the book was published in Lebanon. Later in 1981, after Women at Point Zero had been published, Nawal El Sawadi was imprisoned herself, charged with alleged crimes against the state under the Sadat regime in Egypt in an attempt to silence her. Upon her release, she founded the Arab Women's Solidarity Association and co-founded the Arab Association for Human Rights and she continued to write and speak out against patriarchy and religious fundamentalism. Hello everyone, welcome to another great episode of Books and Blogs. My name is Bilha Luseka. I'm sitting in for the very able Catherine Mwangi, who is not able to be with us this week, but I'm hoping to fill her big shoes. And since it's Afri not African literature, but <laughs> Um, since it's a book that is very close to my heart, a book that is about women, I'm very excited to cover this book. And I am with people who are equally excited to cover this book with me. I'm with the Bookish Club. Did I say that right? Bookish the Bookish People Club. So I'm just going to let them introduce themselves, um, starting on my extreme left. Um, so my name is Modoni Moirore. I consider myself an African literature enthusiast and a literature critic. My name is Dana Ogor and I'm passionate about African literature and just giving a voice to the continent. Hi, my name is Charles Goldberg. I'm an owner, oil and energy journalist. So besides that, I love African writers who brilliantly tell the African story. My name is Shiba Akeni. I am a psychologist and HR professional, on top of which I am a big avid fan of all books that uh, bring out psychology and 
talk about the human feelings and human nature. My name is Philip Odiambo Ogonda, uh, but people call me Philo. I'm a law student at Strathmore and a documentary photographer based in Kibera and an avid African reader, yeah, African literature reader. All right. Yeah. So, just to start off the discussion, does this book fall under the African literature title? Um, I, I would mm -hmm. say yes, because it has been written by an African. And I think it's, I always find that people make that confusion on li African literature and genre. So African literature is basically a book written by an African, whether in the continent or in the diaspora. Okay. Genres now are the different areas. So we can have quite a number of genres still within African literature, so yes. Let me, so before we get into the book, um, your book is, your club is known to specifically cover African literature only, which is actually why I should join your club, because <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge African literature enthusiast. But why is it that your book club decided to specifically and only review African literature? Most of us growing up, we've only read Western books. And, you know, it's time for us to read our own stories. Um, and coming together, because it was such an organic coming together as a book club, we felt it's time we give voices to that African voice. So we've spent X number of years reading books that are not written by Africans. We didn't even know there were so many, you know, books written by Africans. So we figured let's give a, let's give a voice to, you know, to Africans and read their stories and spread the word. So. All right. Anyone with a different opinion? No, same. Maybe just an addition because we need to give more credit to them, just like she said. Because you know there are lots of African writers who are not known. And making them known, you know, has to do with you know us creating it. Because as a club, we also make them known to other people. So I think that's really important. You know, they tell our African story. So I think it's a, uh, something everyone of us enjoys. Yeah. All right. So and share. Okay. Also, uh, we are coming from a point where uh, when you ask someone any African writer, they know they will just mention Chima Chebe and Chimamanda. Yeah. Chimamanda. <laughs> but then uh, we are coming into age where there are so many budding writers that need to be that that, that need. To be explored. Yeah. All right, I'm excited. I'm excited to get into this discussion. And I'd like to start with you, Sheba. You said you have a background in psychology because that's very interesting. Yeah. So this book must have been very, very close to your heart. Um, tell me, as a psychologist, how did this book appeal to you? What aspects of it do, did you like? And did, did you come from a place of understanding? Yes. For me, this, this book was... Uh, not close to my heart, not just as a psychologist, but also as a woman, yeah. And uh, starting off, I think when the book starts off, we are ha we having uh, Nawal as a psychologist who's going into the prison and, you know, trying to talk to the, the women in the prison. And so already at that point, I was, you know, identifying and, <laughs> and you know, looking forward to, to learning. I mean, I haven't, I haven't gone to a prison and I, I really wanted to find out what, what is that like for a psychologist going into a prison. And then uh, throughout the book, I must say the book was really intense. Yeah. <laughs> very, very intense. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it was much of the outlook was very bleak yeah almost throughout the book very little of it is uh, hopeful a lot of it is very bleak and um and at some point actually was was crying because <laughs> yeah this is the story of not yeah. just one woman but the story yeah. of a lot of women that i know yeah a story that even if you, you haven't been that woman, you know a woman who has been through this. And I don't, I don't know if there's any woman who hasn't gone through what uh, Fidel's went through. I think you have gone through some aspect of it because it, 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 it ranges from domestic violence to uh, sexual abuse to uh, physical violence to misogyny to it's it's just a whole range of uh, societal ills that I'm sure one person has gone through at some point or another. Not just as a woman, even men have maybe gone through some of this, but more so for women. And so 
this this book was something that as the psychologist these are all ills that have uh, you come to you people come to you to talk about all these issues and so it's it was something i could identify with very very well yeah, you've talked about so many so many themes and issues and I'm sure we'll get onto that. But for the viewer's sake and for people who haven't read this book yet, because I only interacted with this book in fact when um, a few weeks back somebody just mentioned it to me and, and, and that's when I started reading the book. So maybe Muzoni and then maybe um, Goldberg, you guys can just share a summary of what the plot of this book is so that viewers at home can understand why exactly are we talking about <laughs> so much intensity in the book. Uh, the book um, revolves around this woman Fridos and the author Nawal, it's actually based on a true story, uh, the author calls it creative non-fiction. So it's based on a true story but she's of course added a couple of things but anyway the essence of the story is Nawal um, El Sadawi who's the author as a psychiatrist uh, was working um, at a prison just to do some research on neurosis in women and there was one particular woman who completely refused to meet her. The doctor approached her and said, oh, you're doing a research on neurosis of women. There is a particular woman who I think would be of interest. And Alfred Doss was not having it. And this caught, caught the curiosity of, of uh, Nawal and she really, really wanted to uh, speak to this woman. So this woman is on death row, accused of murdering her pimp, and she is seemingly unapologetic about it. She is ready for death. She has refused all appeals. She has refused to sign an appeal for a presidential pardon. And uh, finally, when it's a few hours to her being executed, she finally agrees to beat um, Nawal El Sadawi and goes ahead to give her story. And that is how we get to the meat of the story. And it's actually quite a harrowing story, starting from her childhood, um, born in poverty in Egypt. The father was abusive, though he was a religious man, he was quite abusive. He would abuse the mother, abuse the children. And when the parents died, the mother and the father died. Oh wait, before they died, she actually went through FGM. And soon after the parents died, she was taken in by an uncle and taken to school um, and after um, so she's gone through school she's gone through high school the uncle got married and decide, uh, the wife decided um, because they had a close relationship so the auntie decided I think we should marry her off to a rich man who was 40 years older so they marry off three dolls to a 40 year old older man and it's constant abuse it's constant physical abuse it's constant sexual abuse it's just a constant barrage of ad, a, abuse and she finally decides to leave when she leaves she wanders and finds um, a coffee house and decides to go in the coffee house the owner of the coffee house takes her in and just when she's thinking of oh, finally some light he turns to be an abusive guy he no, abuses don't finish everything for right, them they need to finish <laughs> summarize and say this and I think I will just quote <laughs> I will quote something she says in the book and comes early on in the book and she says every man she has ever met has filled her with only but one desire to bring her hand smashing down on their face so yeah that summarizes free Dowse's experience at the hands of men and that is why this book I feel is, is quite important yeah yeah and we'll, we'll get back to that quote because I think it's a very powerful quote yeah. Uh, very few women get to that point when you want to literally slap every man that comes your way. You, you must have gone through very traumatic experiences. But I'm interested to hear from you, Goldberg. As a man, how did you feel about this book? <laughs> because there's actually one review I read on Goodreads that said this book is too feminist. Um, okay, <laughs> I don't want to, to, to take on that, but my, my interpretation of the book, first of all, is that the playwright, Nawal, has really, you know, uh, managed to provoke the, the reader. He's a reader, you have all these emotions, you have mm -hmm. anger, you have, um, what do you call it? What I felt most was anger, you know, and again, I was discussing this uh, to some of the members in the club, the place of a woman in the society. So, uh, how hidden is the woman, or how outward is the woman? 
So, because, you know, uh, if we focus on some of the good things about the book, because, you know, there's so much admiration to be, uh, to be drawn from the woman, the protagonist, uh, that is odious. So, um, she's, okay, uh, now I'll take you through uh, the, the disastrous journey of this woman. But again, the admission to be drawn is that she's trying to rise above every tragedy after tragedy, from an abusive childhood to uh, being married off, to uh, someone wanting to take control of her life, the pimp um, in the... In the, in the in the business she was in the in the in the trade she was in that's in prostitution okay, that. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you can. all right so yeah and uh, as a man i thought that um women need to be seen more not 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 really seen actually need to even speak out because you, know, you know unfortunately traditionally uh, women are just there to be seen and not heard because uh it could be feminist, yes, and I have nothing against feminism, by the way. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with empowering women and all that. But mm -hmm. I also feel like, um, you know, at some point, let me take you very particularly as we speak about the, the race of a woman. There's a point where she goes back to school and her life looks like it's back on track. Mm -hmm. you now she's back to school, she's an excellent student, mm -hmm. she's not mm -hmm. cliche or, or conventional, she's not, no longer focusing on marriage or kids. She just wants to be an A student and she becomes an A student because she, she gets an award, yeah. she completes school, she has an amazing friendship with one, one of the teachers, Miss Iqbal. And I think if a woman is also educated and able to liberate herself, because you know, it's one that unfortunately she wasn't able to walk across the stages of the world as a modern, uh, liberated, educated, sophisticated woman, you see? So, but I feel education has a role to play, it really enlightens you, but I feel uh, she wasn't able to really tap into that. That's where again she had to go back to prostitution and she was taken advantage of. Though later on she became an office assistant, you guys remember. But I feel that if uh, women could really stand up for each other, because unfortunately some of the women pushing her to the corners of her tragedies were women. The auntie was a woman. The, um, the person who introduced her to the trade of prostitution was also a woman. But if they were there to just maybe, maybe make her rise up, or the, way, the men as well, because you know men, it's an item also we need to support women. She was an educated woman. But the, the most she got was an office assistant job. Well, she, the pay was this pathetic, and she decided that you know life as a as, as an office assistant was couldn't be any worse than being a prostitute. So she had to go back. Yeah. yeah. Rightly said, um, Diana. What did you love about this book? There's a lot of part where you could actually tell that this is this is a, a lady who's actually understood her entire society. She's not coming in as an outsider True. who's trying to see what happens in the world. She can actually tell you, I know how the politics runs, she's read a lot of the history and there's nothing new that she's seeing in her life or nothing new that she's seeing that's changing in society. So from her perspective, even if she dies now, there's nothing new that happens to the people who are coming in later. So at the point of her death, she actually believes she's the most empowered because at this point she has chosen death. And I agree. Philip, yeah. what did you like about the book? I like the time. I, I like the timeless nature. It's a book written almost 30 years ago, but then uh, 30 years later, in, in 19, it, it was written in 1970s, and but now in the 2019s, uh, we're still facing the same challenges. Mm -hmm. We're still facing. We're still seeing the same women being treated the same, and still women haven't been had the women society. The women's place in the society haven't been affirmed. So the timeless nature was something I quite um, admire. Oh, yeah. Sheba, on to you as our psychologist. <laughs> um, her decision to, I'm going back to that ending because for me, I feel like the beginning and the ending in the beginning are the most powerful parts of this book. Do you think that she was justified to choose her death? I, from her journey, I completely understood where she was coming from. But I felt like this was an illusion of that a decision, I mean, of choice, an illusion of choice, that she actually made a choice. In, in my opinion, from how her life was going, it was inevitable that she would end up like this, yeah, that she would end up having to die, yeah, or live a life that is not even worth of a human being. So I felt like, for me, it wasn't, it, it should have been a victorious ending, but for me, it wasn't. I felt lost, I felt like if this is the decision that a woman has to make to die, that is just an illusion of choice. And I think at the end of the day, this brings us back to this question of feminism. Yes. Feminism is not for women, yeah. it is for everyone. Yeah. If it is just for women, we will 
continue fighting this fight till the end. And choosing yeah? death. And choosing death. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Feminism is for everyone. And we need to understand that just because you empower a woman, yeah. just because you help out your sister, your mother, your, your uh, auntie, that doesn't mean that for you as a man, it is taking away anything from you as a man. Feminism is for everyone. Can we say that maybe the experiences that she had gone through in her life had finally taken a toll on her. What can we say about her mental health? Okay, first of all, let me, let me say that, you know, not from first-hand experience, but, you know, from very close experience. Every mad person, you know, as we can put it basically, has their own truth. You know, sometimes the stuff is very cruel mm -hmm. on people who are going, you know, undergoing through uh, mental torture or psychological torture or tormentation, or tom or torment rather. And you know, like for spiders, um, yes, she had hardened. You know, she had tried. Come on, guys, let's say, you know, <laughs> she, she had tried to, you know, to really harden more, like, you know. Had she? You know, without losing it. That's true. You know, without, yeah, true, without losing it. Because yeah. I'm thinking yeah. if it's a, uh, uh, and not in a bad way, if it's uh, just an ordinary modern woman going through the tragedies, abusive marriage, you know, if it's reject me, that's, you know, famous accusation. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have been worse. Maybe someone would have resorted to something like suicide, you know? So, yeah. but she had hardened and, you know, at a point, I want to take you back to a particular scene whereby she's, the Arab, she's with the Arab prince mm -hmm. and she wants to kill, who gets too terrified. Actually, the book yeah. says, the world says, the one screaming like a woman <laughs> because the prince thought that, uh, uh, What's the name? Paris would, 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 kill, would, would kill him. So that's when he called the police. But again, uh, you realize, even after the police were called, uh, she was saying, um, I hate all of you, you know, doctors, uh, unfortunately, even us in the profession, journalists, you know, <laughs> uh, oh man, I hate you, I hate you so much, you know, because I feel also she thought that in the place she was, there are people who would have done something, but they didn't do it. Maybe back in her head, she found that. And maybe that's, we could, we could share that as well. Like there were men in her life who didn't who were positioned but they didn't really take up the place. Like, you know, the dad was abusive, he, he shouldn't have been. The uncle shouldn't have moved in her and, and, and used the same bed. We're gonna ignore that by the way for now. <laughs> so but the men there were men placed on her path but it didn't and that's how on now on to how you know the, the mental whatever the, the mental uh, struggles she went through. She, she, she. Um, I, I just want to be, to be very, be very basic and say she, she tried. You know, she tried at that point because if it's a modern, ordinary woman, she wouldn't have endured all the pain. And that's when uh, maybe at the point where she was even given the point of either choosing death or life imprisonment, she was like maybe. People, I don't even maybe people are in the prison or the, now all her seven she, she was thinking this one is so psycho. Why, why do you want to die? Like, you know, so soon. But then she, she really tried, and every mad person has their own truth. Because what she was stating, even in, at, her, at her mad state, if I could say that, was the truth. Mm -hmm. She felt that the men around her didn't really stand up for her. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think for me, when I was thinking about the ending, and I mean the beginning, her refusal to speak to the psychologist, her refusal to sign. Who's to say she hadn't lost it already, you know? Who's to say maybe at that particular point, and I mean, feel free to disagree, yeah. maybe at that particular point, she was going through some degree of madness. I don't know. I think um, it's a call out on how we view mental illness, mm. yeah? Because if you do not understand somebody's actions, you consider them mad. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, of Fidaus, we didn't understand why she was choosing death. Yeah. because it's not the normal thing to do so because you don't understand somebody's choices you either think they're crazy because they're going out of the norm but maybe it's actually not a mental illness maybe it's trying to call you out to finally see me I need you to look at me I need you to see me I need you to see what I'm going through and the only way you can see me is, I, is if I do something out of the ordinary which is what she was doing if she had agreed to the interviews it wouldn't have roused the curiosity of the psychiatrist, yeah? And with so many people, at the point where people are considering you mad, and this is, you know, ule ni mwenda wazimu, or apana atana na ule ni mwenda wazimu, anapigia kelele sana. It's because you've been trying to communicate something, and nobody's receiving that information. So, that constant trying to tell somebody something, and nobody is giving you their ears, you result to outrageous, decisions like Fridaus did and, and said, you know what, I'm not talking to anyone, I choose death. Yeah. yeah? 
So maybe how we understand mental illness is, is also a, a big thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And maybe how we do not understand mental illness is also <laughs> a, big, is a yeah. bigger thing. Yeah. And I must admit, especially in Africa, there is this cloud around mental health mm -hmm. and there's clearly a lack of understanding. If you notice everyone, you all of us almost know somebody who is going through some form of mental health, a mental illness, but do we talk about it? Most of the time, no one does. Whether it's in the urban areas or in the Uko Shago, people don't talk about mental illness. So maybe that just goes to show up where we are at as Africa. I want to talk about the ending, where Nawal is now driving back and she wants to almost hit everyone on the roads. And I mean, rightly so, she's angry. She's angry at men, she's angry at the world, she's angry at everyone who did Firdaus wrong. And she says, but she's not as brave as Firdaus is. Do we think that her actions were brave in the end? What, what do you guys think? Do you think that her choice was brave? A choosing death is courage, yeah? To choose to die, everyone is afraid of death. Yeah, to choose to die is courage. Yeah, sometimes yes, when people are committing suicide, people are told ah, that that is weakness. <laughs> yeah, that is weakness. Yeah, how can you choose to die? I mean, you could have talked to someone, but at some point you have tried. You have done all you could. I mean, Fidel's story says it all. She 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 did her best to try and keep alive. Yeah, but. At the end of the day, she decided because continuing in the same line that she was going, continuing in prostitution, continuing with uh, men continually, you know, just putting her down. I think choosing death for her was courage. All right, I'd, I'd like to hear a difference or in opinion. No? <laughs> I, I, I almost agree with her because, you know, from a psychological point of view, but I think her choosing death was. Uh, was Firstly, we've talked about mental illness, and uh, one thing, you know, it either results to uh, either suicide in most cases, which we do not really talk about, unfortunately. But someone who wants to die does not really want to die. So I still believe somewhere, I still believe that she did not want to die, die, so that she had no choice. You know, she thought that by, by dying, I'll just forget the world, because she's run out of options. You know, she's tried being an office assistant, she's gone, you know, she's, she's gone back again to the prostitution um, trade, it has failed. She's tried men, they have failed her terribly. So I think she she didn't really want to die, die, in the sense of dying and not living anymore. Okay. She had ran out of options. <laughs> Explain that. She didn't want to die, die. die. <laughs> because, I mean, if she didn't want to die, die, she could have she easily signed. Yeah, yeah, she could have easily no. signed. Then again, which brings us now to a new topic of desperation. You know, where was she coming from? By the time you're you waiving your option to be in prison for life, where you can still enjoy, because you know, this prison mates and food and all those things you wouldn't really get out there if you're jobless but uh it's it's the desperation you know you you've, you've tried you went to school you you tried a job it didn't work out you tried being a prostitute even by yourself it didn't work out so i think the last thing left for you is to choose what's given and not necessarily what's given because again there was a choice of being in prison for life she ran out of options so to speak the desperation, you just desperate. Nothing is working for you anymore. You try to die and experience a whole new world if they, they start after death. We are discussing Woman at Point Zero by Nawal El Sadawi. I said that correct. Please, um, we're going into a short commercial break, but when we come back, we will be talking about um, misogyny in the book. We'll be talking about whether Firdaus experienced love in the book. Stay tuned. <laughs> 